Welcome to Naked Age, a historical audio series exploring uncommon stories and profiling unique people who have gone to extraordinary lengths to live a nude life. I'm your host, Evan Nix. In this episode, we'll meet the remarkable Laura Boswell, one-time owner of California's Lupin Lodge and a lifelong nudist with a distinct point of view on nudity. This is Naked Age. You're listening to Naked Age. To start a nudist club in the 1930s meant taking on incredible financial and legal risk. In most areas, parks could only run for part of the year. The grounds were costly to maintain, and many of these clubs did not advertise. Profit margins were naturally low. The catalyst for a club to survive, despite these obstacles, in many cases, came down to a mix of good luck and zealous members who would step up in times of need. This naturally is the case with Lupin Lodge, which in its 85 year history had multiple benefactors who came to its rescue time and again. Nestled in the Lexington Hills near Los Gatos, California, Lupin Lodge is the West Coast's longest continuously running nudist resort. It was first established in 1936 under the name Elysium Foundation by a man named George Marcellus Spray. But by 1938, George Spray was bankrupt, and with creditors nipping at his heels, an investor partner named Eugene Lassine bought him out and took full control. He ran the club until 1946, when he sold the property to a French expat living in San Francisco named George Buffil and his wife Paulette. Over the next few years, George and Paulette experimented with different identities for the club, before landing on the name Lupin Lodge in 1949. But by the 1960s, Buffil's health and Lupin's by proxy were in decline, and the club once again needed a savior if it was to survive. This time, two Lupin members would come to its rescue with a creative solution for buying the property and growing its membership. One of these members was a highly intelligent Yale and Stanford graduate named Glenn Stout. Without the financial means to purchase the property outright, Glenn and another member named Laura Boswell drew up an agreement to buy the club on a lease option. As business partners, Glenn and Laura would run the club together for years before Laura sold her stake and left the club in the 1970s. She would later return to live at Lupin as a member. Glenn retained ownership until he passed away in 2015. His widow, Lori K. Stout, still owns Lupin today. In the 1980s, Glenn Stout wrote a detailed history of Lupin Lodge, which he published as a series of articles in the Lupin Lodge Random Times newsletter. In this history, he writes about Laura and how the two of them came to rescue the club. Lacking a very wealthy and blindly generous benefactor, what the place badly needed was a younger, incurable optimist with unlimited energy, patience, and imagination. Laura, no stranger to Lupin, had reared a family of three children with spouse Warren as part of the membership since 1958. Raised in a naturist environment during her childhood in the 1940s by somewhat unconventional parents in Berkeley, Laura would be a superb role model for any feminist, wishing for her daughter the self-confidence to open her mind, take reasonable risks, and reach for her personal potential. Multi-talented, artistic, intelligent, athletic, and well-educated, she never seemed to consider gender a limitation. 
As an entrepreneurial veteran of two family business startups, she well understood the limitations of Lupin's resources and had practical experience in making a little go a long way. She could scrounge with the best. She also brought good humor and a free spirit to the job of caretaking Lupin. In effect, she would become the Lupin family's all-purpose earth mom, a variation of that selfless societal role of overqualification and undercompensation dumped on women to perform out of love and duty. In all respects but wages, which were necessarily token for everyone on the payroll, she was personally strong enough to be able to play and enjoy that usually one-sided game on her terms. While the marginal lupin might never become a beacon for materialism, it was like a large blank canvas to the creative artist in Laura. She saw only possibilities. Today, Laura Boswell is 89 years old. She no longer lives at Lupin Lodge. She now lives in a 500 square foot treehouse that she built by hand in her 80s in a small private community in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And still, she lives most of her life in the nude. In fact, she's been a nudist her entire life, since she was born in Berkeley, California in 1931, when the nudism movement in America was in its infancy. With the help of her partner and tech support, Fred, I recently spoke with Laura over Zoom. She was kind enough to share her story and her highly unique point of view on living a free and natural life. This meeting is being recorded. Continue. There you go. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Don't go away. I'm right here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Do you think of yourself as a nudist or as a naturist or neither? How do you identify? I, I just identify with that. I have, I really enjoy life without clothes when it's possible. Yeah. You know, and I don't, you know, you can put a hashtag on it like, okay, that's called nudism. Well, you know, I'm not really interested in the politics of nudism at all. I'm just interested in my own comfort and joy. And to me, it's the ultimate freedom um, to be able to be out in nature, out in the world. And, and that's my main interest in, in life is the joy of it. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> sure, sure. But you, um, I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know much about your history. How, when did you first discover it or how did you become involved in? Oh, well, I was born that way, Evan. <laughs> I mean, I was simply born that way, you know? Yeah, and, I do. Uh, as a baby, my mother tells stories about me running around with, I'd take my diaper off. Can, you can imagine diapers are horrible. I've got but, a toddler. I can definitely neighbors, imagine that. Yeah, neighbors would call her and say, your baby's outside without anything on. And she would retort with, well, don't look if you don't want to. And that was her story. My parents were uh, nudists. My dad and mom were, were nudists back in the uh, thir early 30s. I was born in 1931, so that's, uh, that's a while back. <clears throat> My father and mother, we were uh, living in Berkeley well, I, I look back now and I realize that life in Berkeley is different than life anywhere else on the earth, I'm sure. <laughs> you know. I'm sure you're right. Uh, Berkeley was, uh, you know, they were like uh, different people. And so I was, that's when I was born and raised raised in that, that atmosphere where body acceptance was, of course, this is who I am. This is what feels good and that was about the you know the sum total of it for me as a child it simply felt good to be without clothes when it was hot and I put clothes on appropriately when it was cold or when I needed to and uh, that was kind of like it 
So your parents lived a pretty free life. Were they, did they go to nudist clubs? Did they bring you to nudist clubs? Was that part of it or? Well, uh, actually they had, there was a group of friends, I beg to recall because I was really little then, but they had friends who were families. They had, and the families were, there were kids my age and older. And uh, we were living in Berkeley and we would go to, they would rent something like the Alameda Springs or something, some kind of an indoor pool thing. And I remember going there with my parents and, and these other families and we'd bring food along and we would swim in this plunge, this swimming pool, all naked. I didn't think about it as being, uh, this was a naked thing, but everybody there, everybody meeting, uh, maybe there were five or six families with, with kids, but it all seemed like a great fun thing to be doing, s- swimming naked. <laughs> and uh, then my parents moved uh, in the hills above Walnut Creek in California, and it was uh, like, seven or eight acres in the hill and it was so secluded that you could see no you could see no neighbors from our house so it seemed like every weekend these families with their kids would come up to our house and run around nude just like it was a nudist camp or something and uh it was great for me because there were these kids my age, and we could run around outside uh, in the seven acres, and there were no houses. It wasn't like uh, suburbia or anything. We couldn't even see any other houses, which is why my parents bought the place, I'm sure. I never questioned anything about what motivated them to sell one house and buy another, but I'm sure it was because the the one that I remember most was so secluded that um, it was appropriate to run around with nothing on in the summertime. When you were growing up and when your parents were potentially uh, sort of dabbling in nudism in the 1930s was when it was really beginning in earnest in this country. Before that, yes. people certainly got nude and even got nude socially, but it wasn't a movement, so to speak, in the sense right, that right. people were organizing. And Yeah, I remember uh, seeing some publications called Sunshine and Health. It yeah. was a publication, probably it's long since not published, but I was a kid and, my, and, and that came to the house and... Uh, so some of my friends, little kid friends, would love to come to the house so they could look at the nudie magazines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It was probably pretty popular, even now. I was like uh, seven or eight and nine years old, and I distinctly remember having to wear pants when I walked out the front door, I had to wear shorts, but I didn't have to wear a top because my brother, he wore shorts. He didn't have to wear a top. And I remember one day somebody in the neighborhood reported to my mother that I was not wearing a top. And my mother said to me, "Uh, maybe you should wear a top. And I go, why? I said, well, because uh, you're going to be older, you're 10 years old now, and you're going to be starting to look older. I go, and I, so I said, oh, okay. So I put a shirt on, and I wore a shirt after that. But that was the extent of it. You know, growing up, it was, uh, I realized that there was appropriate things and not appropriate things. And when I got into high school, um, uh, I convinced some of my (coughs) high school friends to go uh, climb a fence and get into a a high school swimming pool. And and we were all swimming naked in the dark, pretty much, I think it was. (laughs) But that was uh, an adventure for all of them, I'm sure. And it was uh, 
an adventure for me to introduce that element to uh, my high school friends. I don't think anything ever came of it like, oh, she's a bad person or, oh, my goodness, don't hang out with her. I never uh, had that. Uh, I never had that experience. But um, anyway, so that was kind of my early experience of family nudism. And then I went away to college and, and uh, went to art. You know, art, artists were kind of a different breed of, it's not exactly, it was kind of like, uh, we were all kind of free spirits in a way that was different, but it didn't involve nudism at all. I never, I never remember having um, a bunch of, of college friends going nude at all. It never, I guess it never, maybe it never occurred to me. It was just some things that uh, I did not didn't do for my own reasons of uh, comfort. And then I met uh, my, my best friend's older brother. Uh, and uh, anyway, she married brother. And so I eventually married her older brother and we moved to Fresno and started having babies, had three babies in four years. And, wow. Oh, and I, 1960, he was a piano and organ salesman, and he sold an, a Hammond chord organ to a, a couple. And they said something about, a parent, I don't know, I was not there, but they said something about their, they go to this place over the Santa Cruz Mountains called Lupin. And so he came home and told me, and I said, oh, that, I never heard of that place, but that sounds like fun. So we went over there, and it just happened to be in December or something, and nobody in their right mind would take their clothes off, you know. But uh, we decided that we liked it so much there that um, we didn't really want to raise the children and be doing what we were doing in Modesto. So we thought, okay, we'll just sell everything thing and um, build a house right above Lupin. And that was, uh, so, so that was a full-on experience of being a, a social nudist. Up to that time, social nudism was, and still isn't particularly interesting to me as, as a, uh, you know, a social movement. I've, I'm always more interested in my own particular pleasure and, you know, what's comfortable for me. My my partner, Glenn Stout, was, he liked the idea of, of, of a social nudist movement way more than I was interested in it. I just like being naked, mostly, <laughs> and being at Lupin and then, so, you know, and then we had the opportunity uh, because I, I was uh, taking care. I was a caretaker at Lupin, involved with uh, its maintenance and so forth. So I got even more involved with the Lupin thing. Oh. George Bofill was the owner, and so he and I were good friends. And I, and he was a much older man. And his, his wife, who was not at all interested in nudism as such, uh, they had like beauty shops or something. So Lupin was really more of his hobby. He wasn't really interested in it as, in a, as a movement or a business, but it was kind of his hobby. Because I was there for a couple of years taking care of Lupin, you know, cleaning bathrooms and so on and so forth. and then. George, the old Frenchman, and Ethel, the manager, got very sick. They had flu or something, got very, very sick. Oh, and George had a stroke. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it was uh, a conversation that Glenn and I had about what's going to happen to Lupin if George dies. And uh, so... Glenn, uh, who was a, he was a, uh, vice, a vice president 
of a pharmaceutical company in Silicon Valley at the time. And, and he was pretty, he was a Stanford graduate and a graduate of Yale. And so he seemed like he was a pretty literate guy. And so I uh, told him of the story, you know, like George is, uh, is got a stroke and he may not survive. And I don't know what's going to happen to Lupin. So he Glenn fashioned a, a proposal to uh, George that uh, we buy Lupin at a certain amount and uh, that we bought it on a lease option. Sure. And uh, so every five years we would uh, re redo the lease option at that initial price. And uh, so that's how George, that's how uh, Glenn and I became the uh, the owners of Lupin, as it were. You guys saved her. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that was even in the paper that you read. It was, yeah, actually, Glenn. Um... Very literary, yeah. I, I would add. He, his writing is very, very uh, captivating and, and really fun to read. But yeah, he spoke, he wrote Glenn, a little bit about that. Yeah, Glenn was a very good writer and he did, he did all of the uh, promotional writing about Lupin and uh, what our mission was and that sort of thing. None of that, you know, I didn't care about that. I just was uh, interested in keeping things running at Lupin, um, making sure the pools were cleaned and the hot tub was properly maintained and that sort of thing. So, And in addition to that, you guys, or at least you did a lot of repairs and upgrades to the grounds. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we start because it's in the beginning, there was just uh, uh, Glenn and myself. And so it was pretty clear that it if we were open and make make it work, we needed a staff of people, so we started, uh, uh, you know, getting people to come and uh, live and live there. And so we had a live-in staff. One time, I think we had as many as twenty-five to thirty people living there at Lupin, who were on staff. They all, you know, if they were working for their own board, we needed to have food service, so we. We had a full-on restaurant also, and uh, so I got involved with, you know, that. There were times when people didn't show up to cook, and so I, being kind of the manager of Lupin, I ended up doing a lot of the cooking. Um, and so that was uh, <laughs> a very busy part of my life at that time, yeah. plus having three children we see one in grammar school and two in high school and and uh that sort of thing and uh, uh building the house at the same time as running lupin wow yeah very busy very busy yeah. so my youngest son and his wife uh were living uh, he was helping me out at Lupin on staff, and so they needed a place to live. So they lived in one of the uh, cottages, <clears throat> houses at Lupin, and and uh, then they had a baby. So my grandson, Shane, was born there uh, at Lupin, so, um, wow. and Shane's still a big part of my life. My young youngest son died a few years back of cancer. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of, and Glenn got married and had a, twin girls who are now, I think, graduated, just graduated from high school uh, recently, maybe last year, or year before. Anyway, so uh, then Glenn died, of course. And his his wife inherited Lupin, 
and so I don't I have little or no interest in lupin as such at this time because I don't need it I can run around naked here sure <laughs> which I do um, and it's not it's not really the same I can't be everywhere on the property but we have a swimming pool in the backyard and, and uh, we can be back there sans clothing and that that's what interests me yeah um, you, you mentioned you live in a tree house what's um what's that like? yeah yeah i built a tree yeah i like i like building so i built a tree house and uh i live here in my tree house that's amazing and um yeah amazing <laughs> so. <laughs> how old is your son i have a uh he's about 20 one month now, so I have almost a two-year-old. Oh, okay. But I'm just curious to know, you know, you did that with your kids and uh, are open about it with your grandkids, it sounds like. Um, do you recommend that, you know? Do you have any thoughts about uh, raising your children in that environment and, and uh, you know, what's what well, are your feelings? They didn't have a lot of thoughts about it at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, it, it was a natural thing to be doing <laughs> for me. And uh, my kids always kind of embraced whatever it was that I was doing, whether it was building a house or, or you know, running running loop, and they were always involved with that, with whatever I was doing. So I guess looking back, um, it wasn't like okay, well we're we're all going to get we're going to be nudists now. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. So that was never like. <laughs> Sure. We just were. Yeah. They were little. Um, I think my youngest uh, son was uh, probably about th four years old, five years old when when uh, joined Lupin. L they were little guys. My I had three children in four years, so they were all like. They all seemed like they were babies at the same time and all grew up at the same time, which they did. That's wonderful. Um, um, anyway, so just from my own personal experience, I think uh, just enabling or allowing uh, babies to be clothes free, they don't like clothes anyway, f I figured out. I don't think I have any really close good friends who aren't accepting of maybe they can't, you know, live a nudist lifestyle like I do, sure. <laughs> but uh, they embrace it uh, or would maybe are even envious that, you know, I've been able to in my life. But I think uh, I can't think of. Well, I can think of some relatives who would not be understanding, and I simply don't care. I mean, it's not not a subject that, you know, it's like walking into a room of Democrats and saying something about being your Republican. You just like, why why bother, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, anyway, you don't so do it for their approval. Yeah, yeah. As long as I can be comfortable in doing what I want to do when I want to do it pretty much that's the best I can hope for do you think that uh, you would like to see any laws change in our society in terms of being able to go nude oh, tons you know? and tons of law. most laws yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's practically hardly any laws that I wouldn't change uh, for what I consider to be a better law, but uh, sure. you know, that's just, that's life in America. Yeah. Um, I think probably there are places in the world that are way more relaxed about social nudity than, than Americans. I think it's very heavily involved with uh, religion. You know, there's some, some countries that are uh, based on religious notions 
um, none of which in interests me at all. Um, I think probably my my parents were atheists. I'm mm -hmm. sure of it. You know, but I don't go around uh, preaching it. Well, maybe I do a little bit, but <laughs> 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 anyway. Um, I appreciate that. I'm inclined to agree with you about it being much more of a personal thing than this whole movement that um, it's been yeah, it's, made it's out bad. to It do. has to be a personal thing, but that's the, way, that's the way it is. And there are lots of things about the way I think about the world that are personal and I don't proselytize, you know, why, sure. why bother? <clears throat> I simply, the people I hang out with and, and uh, that I'm close to uh, are people that are, are uh, you know, closer to the way I think, otherwise, why bother? I would certainly like to see more, more accept body acceptance, in generally speaking, but I, I realize that there's a huge industry to counteract that, you know, all the, the beauty industry is uh, huge and certainly doesn't support that notion at all. But living as close to the uh, West Coast as I do, it would be wonderful to be able to go anywhere along the beaches in California without clothes. I don't, I don't even, I can't even appreciate a wet bathing suit and I don't think most people do but they wouldn't take it off you know and I, I really uh, find little children that, that are allowed to run around with nothing on and being joyful about it I find that encouraging but uh, you know that's not the way it is in America or in most of the world, I think. So. Yeah, it seems to me yeah, that there I, was once a day where families particularly participated in nudism much more than today. I bring my family to my local club and I don't see a lot of other families there. Um, is that what it was like for you when you were running Lupin? Were there a lot of families? You know? Oh, well, yeah, like you say, Lupin, we had a, at one point, I think Glenn and I actually had about a thousand members of Lupin. We could say that there are a thousand paying members of Lupin. Wow. So, yeah, numbers make a difference. And, yeah. we, you know, Lupin is um, isolated in that it's, uh, you can't see it except maybe from the air. Um, occasionally people would wander into Lupin uninvited just to see for themselves, like, is this real? <laughs> you know, and, uh, but mostly because I lived there so long and spent most of my time, uh, actually I didn't spend most of my time naked because I was always doing projects that required wearing clothes, like cooking. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah. It's dangerous to be cooking naked sometimes. And because we were a year round club, obviously in the winter time, we didn't go naked. We were, nobody was allowed to be in the pool or the hot tub with anything on. That was one of our rules, I might say, um, which is understandable. You know, who would get into a hot tub with a bathing suit on? And our pool was heated in the in the winter time, so that was, you know, um, a comfortable thing. But uh, you know, we had thirty staff people running around taking care of Lupin, mostly with their clothes on, except in the summertime. I have some friends that were living here in one of the. Uh, one of the uh, rentals for a while, and uh, 
she was pregnant. She had her baby here wow. at, at our community right here in, they lived in one of the yurts. And uh, we've been really good friends for a long time now. They now have two babies and the older of the two, she would go swimming with me naked and it was a delight to her. Now she says, can we be naked? And I go, <laughs> yes. So it's, it's different for them. Yeah. They can only be naked here at our pool in our backyard, but it's not something that uh, they they do at home. But she remembers how fun it was for her to be naked. Wow. So she says, can, can I be naked? I go, yep. And so, you know, that's, it's a special thing for her. And, and she realizes she, and she's only four, going on five years old now. She realizes that there's a special place and a special time when that can be a part of her life. And great, grateful when we can live uh, naked. As Fred and I were this summer, we spent six weeks in a, a forest in Oregon, naked, every day, all day, yeah. and it was delightful. Wow. I felt uh, like I felt like I did when I was a little kid, uh, just so free. And I know that as soon as we drove out in our car, we couldn't be, but that's just the way it is. Yeah, that's a and hard moment. Yeah, and I'm <laughs> grateful for when we can and are, have that freedom. That's wonderful. That's amazing. Po very possibly if I had uh, come to nudism as an adult, as as you have, well, your wife mm -hmm. uh, has, Fred has, I might um, think differently because I've been a nudist all my life so I don't really think about how that would be if I if I couldn't be sure I mean I realize that I can't be a lot of the time mm -hmm. and it has to be okay you know I'm a part of a larger I'm a part of a larger society mm -hmm. um, that doesn't appreciate nudity and uh, you know poor them <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, definitely. Okay. That's or funny. lucky me, I guess. Yeah, I would agree with that. Any any questions you want to ask? No, you've been so, so kind to talk to me for so long. I really, really appreciate it. Well, good. We can do that. And next time, maybe we'll have our clothes off. Yeah. yeah. Make, it, make it sooner than later. All right. Thanks All right. so much. Talk to you guys later. Take care. This episode featured music by Lobo Loco, Dr. Turtle, Deanne Key, and Group 180, and was provided by the Free Music Archive. The theme song was composed by yours truly. Glenn Stout was voiced by John Bidstrup. Special thanks to Carl Hild, Susan Douglas, John Bidstrup, Shannon Lewis, Timothy Sargent, Jeff Tice, Debbie Hurst, Lori K. Stout, Fred Johnson, and Laura Boswell. And an extra special thanks to Stefan Duchesne and Samantha Graham of The Naturist Living Show. If you enjoyed this episode of Naked Age, please subscribe. Send us a message, listen to past episodes, or read the behind-the-scenes blog at nakedage.co. Thanks for listening.